Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have a story where someone makes a $100,000 mistake. Disclaimer, my hatred of geologists is purely theatrical, but if I did have to kill one for some reason, it would be very easy. I'd brandish my obsidian knife at them, and they'd be compelled to approach. That's very cool, they'd say, confident in their superior strength and endurance from all the rocks they carry around at all times. They'd shower me with very interesting facts about obsidian and hover just out of range of the cutting edge, waiting for me to exhaust myself. But as it's volcanic glass, it's very fragile, you see, and isn't very well suited for use as a whip. And then I'd hit them with a wooden baseball bat in my other hand, which they would not have noticed because geologists can only see rocks and minerals. You got them, Tex. On the note of elemental sodium incidents, it's a story told by a professor who taught an inorganic chem class. He was once cleaning stuff after demonstrations he'd had during an outreach lecture for high school kids late in the afternoon. The last piece of glassware to be cleaned was a U-shaped capillary with a bit of leftover sodium-potassium eutectic mixture, also known as NAK, or NAC. He thought that such a small amount, tens of milligrams or so, cannot do any harm, so he just forced it out of the capillary using a squirt bottle, possibly with hexane, and flushed it down the sink. It hissed a bit when it got in contact with water, but everything seemed to be fine until a minute or two later, a loud BANG was heard across the street, and some of the manhole covers around the building hopped, making the noise even worse. In a few minutes, a couple more explosions followed, and the janitor ran across the building yelling, WHICH SON OF A GUN FLUSHED SODIUM AGAIN? It appears that the tiny droplets of sodium-potassium mixture reacting with the sewage water was enough to ignite the methane accumulated in the pipes, oh my gosh. NAK is just a bit less dense than water, so it was likely flowing up and down the water, igniting more methane gas when emerging to the surface. Also, based on the janitor's reaction, this is a pretty common thing. Yeah, that's terrifying. Even if it isn't slightly less dense than water, because it's generating hydrogen, the hydrogen bubbles usually carry it to the surface. So I can imagine that that was a really terrible idea. Now, I would doubt that the amount was only tens of milligrams. I, you, tens of milligrams will instantly get quenched, because sodium's like rather dense. So my guess is that what actually happened is they put more like a milliliter down and maybe that milliliter didn't immediately react and then it had a chance to ignite the mixture of methane and oxygen down the pipes. Definitely a scary experience. I heard a story from my nephew once. His dad, my second cousin, was an agribusiness student and their professor had them mix soil. Instead of testing it with the proper equipment, which would be the same thing to do, their professor ate the soil right in front of them. And just by the taste alone, their professor could tell just what minerals it lacked. I'm assuming that this professor had eaten enough soil in their life to be able to determine what the perfect soil tastes like. You know, I can see this working, I just don't necessarily think that this is the best way to test soil. You can let me know what you think down below. My colleague told me a funny story. His university had an idea to expose future attorneys to some forensic lab experience and designed a chemistry lab class for the final year law students. A bunch of people that had exactly no contact with any chemistry for at least a few years doing experiments. What could possibly go wrong? One guy put a flask on the stirring plate but did not put the stir bar in. His fellow asked him if it was actually working. As he could not see any water movement, the guy replied, Are you stupid? It's mixing magnetically. Another person was meant to neutralize a small amount of not-so-acidic solution with a methyl orange indicator added. Instead of using a base, he just poured in hundreds of mils of hydrochloric acid up to the point that the solution was so dilute that he couldn't see the color anymore. Mission completed. Yet another guy was stirring deionized water in a flask for like two hours. When the TA asked him what he was waiting for, he replied that the pill, stir bar, still hadn't completely dissolved yet. That is hilarious. That's so funny. Oh, uh, this is like such an undergrad thing to hear from someone in their first year. Oh, it's stirring magnetically. Oh, sure it is. Sure it is, bud. My dad nearly shot down an airplane with an improvised rocket. That's not great. He was part of something called the Interplanetary Society, and they had their own reaction mix that they called Super Thermatal Sulfide. He never told me what it was, because, as he said, he liked me having ten fingers. So they made a rocket, basically a pipe bomb that was open on one side and decided to test it out. Unfortunately, they chose to test it in the in-flight zone to a nearby military field. Oh my goodness. So an old military jet came in for a landing, and the rocket missed it by a small margin, and the military came out to have a look at who the heck was firing rockets on their airplanes. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. This is how you go to jail, kids. You should not be making pipe bombs, and you should not be launching pipe bombs at airplanes. That's terrible. It made the papers, and my grandmother was convinced that my dad would never get a job, but would become homeless and live out his days on the streets of Gothenburg. He didn't. My dad's gang had a couple of seriously demented people in it, and they played a lot with explosives, but somehow they all survived without major injuries. Fool's luck, I suppose. Yeah, you should not be playing with explosives unless you are a professional. 
You might think that uh, I advise you guys to not do any dangerous stuff on this channel, and you're right. <laughs> a dad joke. A lie big condenser will never tell you the truth. I'm gonna let you figure that one out. I can add another to the DMAP story somewhat. I was working with some really long chain molecules a while back, as in, the stuff doesn't want to dissolve in literally anything. It was a struggle just to get it in solution long enough to do reactions. Turns out it's only soluble in literally boiling chloroform. So I'm doing an esterification with it using DMAP, and because it was quite a small scale, I just threw a crystal into it rather than trying to weigh out such a small amount. This is actually relatively common for DMAP. People would say they added a few crystals. As one of my peers wrote in his prep that I was following, bear in mind that the total volume was only a few milliliters. I took a TLC sample in a 7 mil vial and added chloroform, before blasting it with the heat gun. Finally, it dissolved. I went to burp the vial, and the entire contents of the vial shot out and went all over my hands. Oh my gosh. This was pretty much the one time I didn't have gloves on. Cue intense paranoia from reading the SDS, and apparently the tiny LD50 for skin contact, but luckily no ill effects, and I'm still alive and kicking. I make sure to wear gloves, even for little things now. Yeah, you definitely got lucky. I'm still not sure if DMAP is as toxic as people say it is, but things end up in SDSs for a reason, and I would definitely err on the side of caution. If you have any stories about DMAP being really toxic, I'd love to hear them down below. I have a story as well. This is from what I've heard. I once worked in an inorganic chemistry lab where we made zeolites using autoclaves. The synthesis is in water and usually heated to around 120 to 150 degrees Celsius, and we have special ovens for their syntheses that cannot go higher than 180 degrees, if I recall correctly. Well, one day all of the specialized ovens were occupied. The chemist in question wanted to complete their hydrothermal synthesis and looked for another oven in the same lab. The other ovens that are used for calcinations can go up to temperatures above 1000 degrees Celsius. These ovens can be programmed in four stages, the first two of which were set to normal hydrothermal synthesis temperatures, but the last stage was probably left over for someone who's using it for a calcination earlier. The chemist forgot to remove this last step and started the program with the autoclave inside. The autoclave violently exploded overnight. The insides of the oven were spread out over the lab with a trail of silica in front of where the oven once had a door. This is the reason why these autoclaves are called little bombs. Nowadays we are still missing this oven, and everyone is explicitly instructed to never use calcination ovens for autoclaves. This is why you don't cut corners and you wait until the appropriate equipment is available, because sometimes if you use a hammer to hammer in screws, things don't go well. Today's Yikes Awardee is Ritter Dagobert. An anecdote from one of my professors. During his study times, one of my professors apparently had high standards for personal hygiene for the personnel working in his lab. From time to time, he would check if the lab techs had washed their necks. He did this with a piece of cotton wadding dipped in benzene, which he dragged over their necks. So presumably the cotton ball with uh, benzene on it's supposed to come out dirtier if they haven't been cleaning their necks properly. I can't see any foreseeable reason why this would be justified at all. If this happened nowadays, I'm pretty sure that professor would be fired on the spot. At that chemist, I worked in a COVID-19 testing lab, mainly in the RNA extraction lab. This was the first lab in a chain of labs used to determine whether human patient samples were positive or negative. In extraction, we would format the samples onto a 96 well plate, lyse the cells, add a master mix, and then use magnetic beads to extract and wash the RNA with various buffers, isolating and purifying before the sample would move across to the pre-PCR lab. Here, four 96 well plates would be grouped and an enzyme mix added, getting formatted onto a 384 well plate before getting put on a thermocycler, which would determine whether a COVID-19 variant was present. A biomed tech incorrectly made the master mix poly-A RNA and proteinase K in extraction, reconstituting the proteinase K with ethanol instead of deionized water. This not only invalidated the four 94 well plates that they'd submitted over the course of four to five hours, but also the four 384 well plates each was grouped with. This is about 1,500 patient samples that had to be rerun through the whole process, costing around $100,000 in man hours and reagents. That is insane. That is so much money from one simple mistake. It was always easy to identify the asbestos samples in mineralogy exams, because those were the ones with do not lick signs attached to them. Yeah, that's probably wise. Maybe, uh, maybe you shouldn't be looking at asbestos too hard. During high school chemistry class, a large sample of phenol in a bottle, one huge solid lump so that it could not spill, was passed around for everyone to smell, to learn how phenol smells. We were forbidden to touch it. Some of my classmates chiseled small amounts of solid phenol from it and melted it onto their hands. Fortunately, they stopped when it started to absorb into their skin, so there was no other symptoms except the chemical burn. The teacher helped them wash it off and learned that high school students are highly untrustworthy and dangerous around chemicals. Yeah, uh... I don't know why a kid would possibly do this. 
maybe they just don't know the dangers of chemicals, but if you don't know all of the hazards associated with a chemical, you definitely shouldn't be melting it in your hands. And that goes for essentially any chemical. I remember another lab story. It was PhysChem Lab with my good friend. You did all those experiments with a partner. It was January, so cold and dark. Our experiment for the day was observing and measuring the emission spectrum of certain gases, using gas discharge lamps, a grating to refract the light into its components, and measure the angle, wavelength dependent, with this sextant kind of device. I forgot its name. Anyway, my colleague was a little bit too long exposed to the unfiltered mercury discharge lamp, which emits a ton of UV, yes, mercury lamps do make a ton of UV, doing his measurements, and had a nasty but hilarious looking sunburn on half of his face for the next day in the middle of January. If you're ever working around uh, mercury vapor lamps, make sure you have appropriate eye protection and make sure that the light isn't just going out into the room. Oftentimes we block this with a big box or something covered in aluminum foil so that none of the light can get out and uh, potentially harm people. At a rock and mineral show, upon seeing a display of various halite samples, I say, I didn't know you guys sold snacks. Yup, they had some fluorescent ones. Very cool. Yeah, very cool indeed. So the next story is a serious one, but I thought it was important to include this because it deals with a problem that a lot of people struggle with. I'm just going to give you a second here to pause the video or stop the video if you're not interested in finishing it. But I'm going to tell this story and I think people need to hear what this person has to say. I have a lot of chemistry horror stories to tell. This is the saddest one. Andy, not her real name, was one of my co-workers in chemistry grad school. One of the most prestigious ones in the USA. We arrived in the same incoming first year class. Most of the class was fresh faced 21 year olds straight out of their bachelor's degree. I had worked for a couple years in an industrial research lab, so I was a couple of years older than most people. Andy had been teaching high school science class, and she was in her late 30s and single. Andy had that self reliant spirit, and she was ambitious. She had something to prove to the world. She gladly took on a project involving a very difficult molecule to synthesize a cyclic oligosaccharide. The yields are very low, and you can only isolate milligram quantities if you're lucky. It's probably some of the most brutal organic chemistry out there. We had our weekly group meetings. Other students were able to list off their accomplishments easily, but Andy would usually come up short on results. I felt kind of bad for her, so I tried to help her out. She showed me that she had to keep her reaction temperature at minus 20 degrees Celsius, which is hard to maintain. It's too warm for dry ice, but too cold for an ice bath, so she'd maintain the temperature using an acetone bath and periodically add dry ice to it to maintain a constant temperature and these reactions could take days. She would attend to her experiment like a nurse to a dying patient, so she was trapped in the laboratory. I had a few thermocouple switched heaters that I used for growing crystals very slowly. They're great. You can keep temperature within a degree, and it could power a cooling or heating device when the temperature got out of range. You could just dial in the temperatures and it handles the boring stuff for you. And this was a well-funded lab, and our professor would get you whatever you needed for your work. I offered her the use of one of mine so she could leave the lab and let the machinery do her job for her. She refused. She just didn't trust it. She had to do it herself. It was our second year in grad school, and I could tell Andy wasn't handling it very well. A postdoc co-worker and my girlfriend and I convinced her to get out of the lab one Friday night to have a double date at an Italian restaurant downtown. We'd had a great time. It was probably the most fun she'd had in months. Just one week later, we got the news. Andy had died of cyanide poisoning. She didn't use cyanide as a reagent in her reactions. She didn't have to die. I would have done anything to help her keep a sane work-life balance. I had no idea she was that far down the black hole of nihilism. She tried to make it look like it was a laboratory accident, but I've worked with large quantities of cyanide, and except for a fleeting whiff of hydrogen cyanide, it's just another reagent. I attended her funeral, and I confessed to her sister that this wasn't an accidental poisoning. This incident makes me sad and angry. How did my thesis advisor allow this to happen? Was there any way that we could have intervened? Why did Andy try to disguise her suffering to everyone? Why wouldn't she accept help from a friend? We were all in a competitive environment, cranking out publications at a breakneck pace. There are just so many unanswered questions. So, a lot of people can be going through stuff, and it's really important to consider that if you're ever upset at someone, you don't know what they're going through. You need to show people grace and give them a chance to improve. So if you can be the light in your lab and help people out, it goes a long way. You might not think you have time and you might be worried about the crunch of life, but sometimes life can crunch you. So it's really important to help those people in need of help and to show grace whenever possible. If you're ever upset at someone, just give them the benefit of the doubt. It doesn't cost you that much. 
and someone could be going through something really tough and they just need your support. They don't know that they need your support and they might be reluctant to accept it, but people need help. If you're ever struggling with mental health or thinking about doing something you might regret, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. This is the number for the USA. It's 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-TALK for those listening. So I hope that if you ever are struggling with anything, you'll reach out to someone who can help. And please don't ever make decisions you can't reverse. Have a great day.